Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to see such a crowd here for Marsha McNutt's talk this evening. I'm Marian Herdiken. I'm the director of the environmental program here at Colorado College and a professor in the uh, associate professor in the philosophy department. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Dr. Marsha McNutt. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you this evening, uh, Marsha McNutt. Her list of accomplishments is quite long, but I'll keep her introduction short because I know we're all eager to hear what she has to say. Uh, we are fortunate that Dr. McNutt began her distinguished career right here at Colorado College as an undergraduate, uh, where she majored in physics. And Professor Dick Hill remembers her as talented, ambitious, and willing to take on big tasks. And I think uh, all of you probably are aware that her career has quite clearly borne that out. Um, so Dr. McNutt earned her PhD at uh, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and then began her career as a professor of geophysics at MIT. From there, she moved on to serve as president and CEO of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in California. And then in 2009, she was tapped by President Obama to direct the USGS. Um, following her stint with USGS, she was appointed in 2013 as editor-in-chief of Science Magazine, and she's the first woman to serve in that role. And as many of you probably know, science is sort of the flagship, I mean, Science and Nature are the two big flagship journals uh, where breaking uh, scientific research in all fields is presented, um, and it's, it's an incredible position that she currently holds. I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. McNutt speak when she gave a talk a few years ago at CC as part of the State of the Rockies program. And what I learned from listening to her that night is what her career as a whole also attests to. Um, Marsha McNutt combines her deep scientific understanding with an incredible capacity to communicate clearly and compellingly across disciplinary lines. She exemplifies the qualities of intellectual rigor and flexible thinking along with an ethic of service and a passion for her work that we hope Colorado College promotes in all of our students. So tonight, Dr. McNutt will speak on climate policy, how can science be used more effectively, and I'd like you to join me in giving her a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, Marianne, for that wonderful introduction. And I have to say, it's a huge pleasure to be back here at Colorado College speaking and um, knowing that I'm back here at CC and I'm not going to have to take any tests or write any term papers, even though I've got um, my beloved faculty members uh, here in the audience tonight. So uh, that's a, a very, uh, very good position to be in. So. Um, I was uh, assigned this topic to speak on tonight, and so I'm going to uh, start with my um, caveats, and that is, in talking about climate policy, how can science be used more effectively? I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of a scientist, and that is, how can we deliver science so it can be used more effective for policy. And leave aside the question of, once that science is delivered, what are policymakers going to do with it? Because, um, frankly, I'm not in the position to be able to dictate to policymakers what they might do with the science, because uh, they have to take science and they have to integrate it with other inputs such as uh, economics, uh, political considerations, um, personal values, etc. And it's not always that the science is going to carry the day. Often science is one of the very most important inputs because it can be one that uh, many people will agree on but we can't always count on it to carry the day. Now the other point I want to make about this title is this term climate policy. We have no climate policy, okay? So um, this is a, a hard place to start a talk. Um, we, we do have 
policies on emissions to the atmosphere, okay? And we do have policies on uh, public health. And we do have coastal development policy. And we do have ag policy. And we do have clean water policies. And we do have policies on wildlife and um, promoting the health of the environment in general. And of course, we have economic policies. And because we have policies for all of those things, what my number one suggestion for is making science more effective is that it's not good enough to deliver just climate science, but rather to start with climate science, but to convert that climate science to its impact in terms of clean air, clean water, public health. How does it impact food production in the future? How does it impact coastal hazards, our economy, and even national security? If you can't take your climate science and translate it into something that we do have a policy on, the climate science is not going to have any impact in policy. So number one, translate climate science to something else that we do develop policies for. Okay, let me give you an example of that. Mercury poisoning. Mercury, po mercury, even in very small doses, is a neurotoxin to both humans and wildlife. But to become bioavailable, in other words, in order for humans to actually take it up and for it to become uh, toxic to our, our cells and our uh, nervous system, it must be converted from its elemental mercury to another compound that's called methylmercury. And that conversion from element mercury to methylmercury occurs in aquatic environments. Now, when I was at the USGS, uh, one of our scientists who was actually in a, um, one of our water resource uh, centers uh, in um, Wisconsin, started mapping out the concentrations of methylmercury around the United States. And the source of the mercury, the number one source in the US, is mercury that comes from the smokestacks of coal-fired power plants. That is the source of the mercury, comes up the smokestack, it's released from burning of coal, but if that mercury falls in the dry Nevada desert or out in East Texas, it doesn't fall in a wet environment, and so the mercury is not toxic to humans or to um, animals. But when that um, mercury falls in the wetlands of Florida or in uh, the prairie pothole region of the Dakotas or in Minnesota, where there's a lot of wetlands, it gets converted to methylmercury. And what Krabenhoff, uh, David Krabenhoff did was he mapped out these concentrations and showed that in many of these places, people couldn't go out to their local lake and uh, fish and eat more than one or two fish every couple months without taking in toxic amounts of mercury that exceeded the um, EPA standards for human health. And what was alarming about this was that the states that produced most of the um, mercury, uh, the coal producing states, were not the states that were paying the price for it. Now when Krabenhoff showed this work to um, the director of the EPA, this was 
the deciding factor in the decision to limit mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. And because of the decision to limit the mercury from the coal-fired power plants, this happened at the same time that there was uh, readily available natural gas. Many of these coal-fired power plants decided that it was just as cheap to convert to natural gas rather than to continue to burn coal. And so throughout the United States, um, so many coal-fired power plants closed down and started burning natural gas that not only did mercury emissions get slashed, but the carbon, uh, the CO2 emissions from those power plants was cut in half because burning natural gas has half the CO2 emissions as coal. So while the EPA decision was based on a human health um, policy, the effect was to limit the U.S. CO2 emissions, and for several years, U.S. CO2 emissions actually decreased because of this map. So as I say, if you want to cut CO2 emissions, sometimes the best thing to go after is not actually climate, but human health. Okay, suggestion number two. Effective science must be unbiased. It cannot be slanted or have the appearance of slant by the questions posed, by the nature of the funding source, by official positions taken by the researchers, or by the mission of the parent organization. I'm sure you've all picked up the newspaper and seen um, people um, uh, give uh, their views on climate change, and you are suspect of their um, positions either because of what organization they represent or where their funding came from or um, other um, things that are on this list. It's very important, and I think if um, we simply made policy based only on science that fulfilled these criteria, then it would be uh, easy to um, weed out a lot of science that is possibly suspect. And let me give you an example. Here's the polar bear. It was actually during the Bush administration. Uh, May 15, 2008, that the polar bear was officially listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Now this is an unusual thing to do in a Republican administration. And it was at a time when polar bear numbers actually were very stable. And there was, uh, from the numbers of polar bears, no obvious sign that the polar bears were in danger of going extinct. And the science that was used to list the polar bears as threatened was based on sea ice. And the, the science that, uh, that came forward showed that the decline in sea ice was so precipitous that it was going to threaten the existence of the polar bear very shortly because this um, iconic animal depended on sea ice for its foraging, and it depended on the sea ice for its animal husbandry. Now, the science that came out of that, what was very important, the factors in the polar bear decision, was that the science that looked at it used, looked broadly at the polar bear, at its husbandry, its reproduction, its foraging, and its relation to the entire ecosystem, and asked even questions like, could climate warming increase the number of prey for the polar bear? So even though the sea ice was gone, could there possibly be more food for it? 
Well, the answer was actually no. There was going to be less food for it. But it asked the right kind of questions that made it um, clear that it was, um, the questions were being asked in an unbiased way. The funding was provided by uh, U.S. Congress, not by a wildlife advocacy organization such as the World Wildlife Fund or the Sierra Club. I mean, all wonderful organizations, but organizations that have as their mission to preserve wildlife. So, of course, they would have a vested interest in wanting to see the polar bear uh, saved. Um, the um, study was done um, by the USGS, which is only a science organization, not a wildlife protection agency, even though after the decision was handed down, it was up to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to implement it. And the culture at the USGS is to stick to the science, not to say once the science was delivered, whether the science said the polar bear should be listed or not, whether it should be listed as threatened or endangered, the USGS took no position on that. This is just what the science is, what the future status of the polar bear will be with declining sea ice, but the USGS took no position on what should be done with it. Now, lest you think all animals are suffering under climate change, fear not. Some animals are actually thriving with climate change, and here's an example. This is a Burmese python. Um, it's actually um, an invasive species. Uh, this is one from the uh, Everglades of Florida. And um, this was another study that was done in order to try to understand should the importation of Burmese pythons be halted? Because, as I say, it's an invasive species, and Burmese pythons don't make it on their own from Burma to the Everglades, <laughs> believe me. What happens is someone brings one um, uh, into the U.S. as part of the pet trade, and it's really cute while it's sitting there in your little aquarium, and then it gets too big. So what do you do? Oh, well, look at this lovely swamp out there. We can just let it go. Well, then it gets this big, and when it gets this big, it can have 200 babies at one time. And um, so there were, and there were a lot of attempts to eradicate them, like um, uh, the big uh, Burmese python hunt that was going to, you know, provide a pair of python pumps for every comer, um, but they're very hard to find out there. You can imagine how easily they can get lost in this swamp. And so the question is, first of all, are they an injurious species? Well, that question was pretty easy to answer. These are a lot of the native animals that otherwise live in the Everglades, and these little white numbers here show you what their numbers are now in the region where the pythons have taken over. So raccoons are down to 0.7% of their previous abundance. Uh, possums are down to 1.1% of their previous abundance. Bobcats are at 12.5% of their previous abundance, and rabbits and foxes, they can't find any. So these uh, pythons are basically eating their way through the Everglades. And what is more is the connection to climate change. Right now, they're in the Everglades. But um, we can project what will be their home range by the year 2100. Now, the year 2100 may seem a long way off, but if you can imagine that a child born today will live to see, likely, the year 2100. So here's their range in the year 2100. OK? Um, so if they can eat uh, you know, uh, a fox um, and uh, a raccoon, imagine what they'll do to your pet dog. 
and um, you know you can't allow your children, your your babies, out in the backyard. So based on this study, the decision was made to ban the importation of these um, pythons and other large constrictors. Okay, so um, suggestion number three. Uh, effective science only happens in an environment with the highest scientific integrity. And what I mean by that is scientists have to follow the observations to their logical conclusions, free of any bias, and there's no political interference in the reporting of the science, and whistleblowers face no retaliation. So um, it's important that scientists feel the answer's the answer, and they don't come up with the answer, and then some political appointee above them is going to change the answer because they don't like the answer. That would be a bad thing. And uh, as an example of that, um, let's look at wind energy. Wind energy is um, uh, an example of a green uh, type of energy of which um, the U.S. is actually uh, very fortunate in having a lot of plentiful wind. And um, this diagram here shows the increase in wind energy generation uh, in the U.S. Uh, that's happened uh, just over the, the last decade or so. And these are the states that have been uh, most aggressive about it, certainly here in the uh, sort of tornado belt here, and also uh, on the West Coast, where a lot of uh, wind farms have gone in. However, there's really no energy that is without impact. And even wind energy has its impact. And there was a study done, um, this was another study by the USGS, that looked at the impact on bats, which are nocturnal animals, and it showed, oops, sorry, showed the uh, mortality from uh, bats that were uh, being, um, hitting the blades of uh, windmills, and what you can see is, especially in uh, this area here, um, the result was um, the number of bats killed per year was between 200 and 400,000 bats per year uh, being killed by windmills. Now, um, you may not feel the same way about bats as you feel about polar bears, but actually you should because bats are very important to the agricultural industry, actually, right in this area, because bats are pollinators. And, um, not pollinators, excuse me, bats are insect eaters. Um, and they, um, by one estimate, um, if there were no bats, um, the farmers would have to apply about $6 billion worth of additional chemicals on um, the fields in order to replace the natural ecosystem services that's done by the bats. So bats are very important. Now, actually, the number of 200 to 400,000 bats per year is not that frightening a number, but the real problem with the bats is that six million bats per year are dying from a disease called white-nose syndrome. White nose syndrome is a disease that came over from Europe and is going through bat colonies, wiping them out. And the problem for these um, windmill operators is that these deaths are called cumulative impacts. So while there's nothing that they can do about the white nose syndrome, they have to consider that these are additional deaths on top of that. Now you can imagine that when the USGS did this study, given how much the US government really wanted to promote wind energy, there could have been all sorts of pressure to suppress this evidence for these deaths. But that's not what happened. 
The uh, attitude within the government was no, this is important information, and we need to work with the windmill operators to find solutions to these bat deaths. How can we find times of day when we stop the windmills, like right at night when the bats are out flying, so that we reduce these deaths, but still continue um, to install wind generation and find a way to protect the bats at the same time. So suggestion number four, if you want science to be effective in policy, drop the jargon. I, I'm sure you've all uh, been uh, around um, scientific uh, discussions where you just sit there and say, I don't even understand the words that are being used here. Uh, what this uh, little cartoon says, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand it. And this guy goes, wait a sec, I'm a rocket scientist and I don't get it. So it's important to find everyday terms to explain scientific concepts. Um, I, I think that's probably well known, but what I find um, the most um, difficult to find the right way to solve the problem is dealing with scientific uncertainty. This has been a very hard problem to deal with for the following reason. Every scientist knows that there's uncertainty associated with climate science. We don't know exactly how fast temperature is going to rise. We don't know exactly how fast, how much uh, rainfall is going to change in any one place. We don't know exactly how fast the glaciers are going to melt. Uh, we don't know exactly how fast sea level is going to rise. There are all sorts of uncertainties associated with every prediction. But the problem is, when you go out and talk to the public, if scientists couch their discussion of climate change with the full uncertainties, the reaction of the public is, scientists don't know what they're talking about. They obviously are not very good scientists if they, if they don't know the answer. And so it's very hard for scientists to be true to the science given that the Earth is a very complex system and we are headed to um, a future which is unlike a future that the Earth has seen before. And there are also unknowns in terms of what's going to happen with policy. We don't know what emissions policy is going to be in the future, which also adds to the unknowns. So, um, so that, that makes it very difficult. Uh, one thing that I've um, seen people do, which is tried to, to help, is um, uh, a group went out and asked a bunch of distinguished scientists, leaders in the scientific community, um, who know a lot about uh, planetary systems and a lot about the climate system, the question, how confident do you feel that anthropogenic climate change uh, is real and is a serious problem? And, um, or how strongly do you believe that humans are primarily responsible for climate change? And these were some of their answers that I thought were interesting. Uh, one person said, as strongly as I believe that wearing a seat belt while riding in a car is a good safety measure. Or, as strongly as I believe that smoking causes cancer. Or, more strongly than I believe that taking a daily vitamin is beneficial for a person's health. So I thought these were all answers that average people can relate to. Because most people probably do realize that, yeah, smoking does cause cancer, and yeah, when I get in a car, I'm going to put on a seat belt. And, well, I could take a vitamin, but there's really no scientific evidence or no medical evidence that vitamins really do anything for your health um, that's uh, been um, well documented beyond just 
eating well. Okay, suggestion number five. It's really important that if scientists are asked to uh, provide science on some issue, that they be responsive. Decision makers need to know the answer to a question now or yesterday, but new research takes years or decades uh, to get the answer. So frequently scientists have to do the best with what they already have in hand. And um, this has been um, uh, extremely difficult for many scientists to cope with, is that when someone uh, calls you up and says, we've got an oil well blowing in the bottom of the Gulf of uh, Mexico, and we need to find a way to uh, control it, you don't say, oh, well, let me think about that and try a few things and I'll get back to you um, in six months. No, that's, that's absolutely not acceptable. They need answers right away. Um, so, uh, as an example of that, this is uh, the cover for, um, from, I think it was uh, two weeks ago, um, Science Magazine. And it shows um, a measure of the drought in California. And what this measure is, is kind of interesting because it's from a satellite that was never flown for the purpose for which it was used. It's a, a satellite called GRACE. And GRACE has, oops, sorry, I keep doing that. GRACE has actually precisely measured the amount of desiccation of California. And the way it's done it, it's measured how much water was pulled out of the ground and how much water was pulled out of the soil, and how much deficit water is lost from the reservoirs, and how much water is lost from the snowpack. And the total of those it's measured by measuring very precisely the loss in mass of all of that water because grace could so precisely measure the gravitational change in California from before the drought to after the drought that all that water that left California, including the groundwater that was pumped out of the ground, it measured the change in gravity in California from before until after. And it was equivalent to more than the total water storage in the largest water in Lake Mead, the largest reservoir, Lake Mead. And that's how much water we lost in California from the drought. And when Grace was first flown, um, more than a decade ago, it was never envisioned that that satellite would be put to that purpose. And yet, when the time came, Grace was able to measure it, and the policy that came out of that is for the very first time, the legislature in California sent a bill to the governor that the governor signed, and for the first time, California will now regulate groundwater such that now everyone can pump out of the ground as much water as they want at their will because the water table has fallen as much as 100 feet in some places in California. In fact, there is so much water gone from California that in places, California is isostatically rebounding in the same way that the Northern Hemisphere rebounded after the ice sheets left after the last glaciation. That's how much water is gone from California. Okay, suggestion number six. Incomplete understanding should not be an excuse for inaction. And I use as an analogy, in medicine every day decisions are made on the best available information. And as they say in, doctors say, above all, do no harm. And this plot, which is hard to see, shows years 
from 1958 to 2003 life expectancy, and it shows for a bunch of African nations, Botswana, South Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Uganda, and it shows how life expectancy was climbing um, through the decades of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and then in the 80s, in all of those countries, it turned over. And it turned over because of AIDS. And it, the reason it turned over was all of those countries sat back and said, we don't think there's evidence that links HIV to AIDS. And until we get hard evidence, we're going to do nothing. And as I say, incomplete understanding should not be an excuse for inaction. And that was the price of inaction in Africa. It was seen in the life expectancy taking that big a tumble. So um, I think I'm sort of running short of time here. So I'm just going to quickly talk about inaction when it comes to sea level rise. So this is the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Um, this particular place happens to be a wildlife sanctuary. And this shows what it's going to be looking like over the next 150 to 200 years with sea level rise. And it shows you how much of that wildlife sanctuary is going to be lost. Now, uh, what's unfortunate about this is that there are um, several um, endangered species that have been introduced to this wildlife sanctuary, including the red wolf, where they're going to make their last stand. Well, you can imagine what it's going to be like as their um, last home gets inundated. So um, there are some techniques now that are being used to try to um, help Mother Nature uh, rebuild um, this, even in spite of sea level rise, um, by um, doing some oyster reef construction and um, allowing um, tree planting and other ways to allow natural processes to help buffer this area against erosion and against sea level rise. So um, natural processes can help shorelines keep pace with sea level rise um, if there's nothing in the way. But of course, um, nothing in the way uh, isn't the case um, where we have uh, many of the world's largest cities. Um, these are um, a list of the world's largest cities, and these are the, the number of them that sit on the coastline. And so for all of those cities in yellow, um, there's um, not a lot that can be done um, when you think of what's going to happen with rising seas. For example, um, this was uh, the Philippines in Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, where warmer West Pacific surface waters uh, spawned this uh, surface typhoon. Uh, the heat um, has increased 10% in the surface ocean since the early 1990s. And that's what led to this monster typhoon. And as you all know, there's another monster typhoon that's being spawned in the Western Pacific right now. Um, this was um, uh, Hurricane um, Katrina, which um, devastated uh, New Orleans. This, um, this hurricane led to the largest human migration in US history since the Civil War. So these are not minor events, even in civilized countries like the US. Um, if you imagine yourself standing at sea level, as time goes forward, because of sea level rise, it's like you're riding a down escalator. So here you're standing, and you're riding this down escalator as sea level rises. But superimposed on that down escalator is the short-term variability of the ocean. And that short-term variability is caused by storms, hurricanes, El Ninos, 
um, other things. So that although it may seem like um, this is pretty gradual, it's not gradual because of these storms and other things happening. So um, what that all means is that when you superimpose that short-term variability on the long-term trend, it means that yesterday's 100-year flood is tomorrow's high tide. And a good example of that is New York City. There was a seawall built in New York City in 1844. The number of times that that seawall is breached is now 20 times more common today than it was back in 1844 when that seawall was built. So um, just in closing, these are my top things that we need to do to uh, use science more effectively. Relate climate change science to a real impact. Use only unbiased science. If you see science that's coming from a biased source, filter it out. Uphold the science, the highest standards of science integrity. Drop the jargon. Be responsive. And don't let an imperfect understanding prevent action. And just to put this in the context of geologic time, if we start since the last glacier, and we came, here's sea level rising since the last glaciation, and we uh, impose some things from human history on this. That's when, this time right here, is when farming began. Here's when sea level stabilized at our current shorelines. That's when the Great Pyramids were built. OK, here's where we are now. And we're going into this uncertain future where sea level has been stable for most of civilized human history. And that's, that's the problem that we actually have to deal with, is um, how are we going to, uh, we put our, our solid roots on the shore of a stable ocean, and it's not going to be stable anymore. So finally, I'll, I'll end with uh, this thought. Science without policy is still science. But policy without science is gambling. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Okay, so the question, um, I've been asked to repeat these questions since this is being taped. So the question is, um, suppose you are a scientist with an organization that has a mission that's conservation-based. Um, how, what, what sort of um, uh, steps can you take to ensure that your science is viewed as being unbiased? Okay, um, the first thing I'd say is, um, do everything you can to ensure that your science is peer-reviewed. Um, peer-reviewed science is the standard that people will look at um, as being um, science that uh, has uh, passed muster and make sure that the peer reviewers you use are peer reviewers that would not be uh, fellow uh, people from like organizations, um, but ideally uh, peer reviewers who would agree to be identified 
to, um, in this case, the Obama administration, and they may be uh, people from uh, universities or um, other uh, organizations that might be viewed as um, not having a particular stake in the outcome, whatever. So that would be one thing you could do. Um, another thing you could do is, um, and I always suggest that people do this, is um, talk about not only what your preferred action is, because usually an environmental organization not only um, will present the science, but they'll present what they view as the action that they want seen done with the um, science. Um, talk about what alternatives are, but why you do not believe the alternatives um, are the best approach and if you can, bring in science, it may not be your own science, it may be other science that you've gleaned from the literature that helps bolster your case that those alternatives um, would not be preferred choices. Because it helps to show that you have thought broadly about um, other um, options and have thought seriously about why they won't work so that you haven't just um, I mean, a lot of times what um, um, s some of these organizations um, are faulted on is they had a solution and then they looked for the science to support it. And by taking that approach, you can say, no, I let the science um, dictate it. I wasn't um, a, a solution looking for shopping for the science. Mm -hmm. um, there and then here, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's a, a really good question. So the question was, how can a bat find a mosquito and still get bashed by the blade? Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's a really good question. So um, when a bat uses echolocation, um, you know, a bat could be flying around in here and it would um, know that there's a wall there and it would ping off it and it would come back and say, okay, there's a wall. Now imagine that a blade is turning and that echolocation goes through when the blade's not there because it's spinning. And so the, the bat thinks that there's nothing there, but by the time the bat gets there, suddenly the blade is there. So I think, that's, that's what I've heard anyway is, is the problem. But um, so it's, it's, it's a frequency sort of thing. So um, what I've heard is that they're also um, playing around with um, tuning the speed, putting a governor on the speed at which the blades can go. And um, maybe that that can be tuned with how often the bats do their echolocation, and maybe that will help too. Yes. Okay, so the question is, um, there have been um, uh, persecutions of uh, scientists who have been some of the, um, in the most forefront, uh, Michael Mann and uh, some of the others, um, and um, are they getting worse or um, what? Okay, so here's what, what I do know. Uh, it doesn't seem to be necessarily going away um, but a couple things have happened. Number one, there was a court challenge to attempts to um, basically um, grab under the Freedom of Information Act the emails of scientists working at universities um, 
at the, um, in Arizona. And um, the University of Arizona fought it, I think, all the way to the Supreme Court and won, um, saying that um, these were, um, uh, that, that these were um, deliberative and they were um, not, uh, uh, they, they weren't um, allowed under Freedom of Information Act. And I forget all the arguments, but this set an important precedent that has now squashed a lot of these attempts um, because it's now making it difficult to um, uh, dig up things that um, attempt to embarrass these people on little technicalities. Um, another thing that, that happened was um, uh, a, a young man who is actually at a, a junior college um, started this wonderful organization which is sort of a uh, group of um, uh, a political defense fund for climate scientists who find themselves being persecuted and it does two things. First of all, it helps them understand how to um, stand up to these attacks and um, it helps them better prepare for when they are attacked and it provides them financial um, support if they find they have to defend themselves. And this organization, um, I've heard from many of the climate scientists who have found themselves attacked, um, has been just um, a huge help to them. Yes, up there. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I got all of that question, but I, it, it had to do with uh, Keystone Pipeline, and what was the other part of it? Yeah, okay, so um, I'm, I'm not sure much about the uh, company in Canada, but um, let me clarify my position on that. I think if I were to write that editorial again, um, I'd write it in a different way to say that um, I would support Keystone, or I wouldn't support it unless, and because I think all the, um, the part about my support of it, it had so many ifs on it, and, and people sort of um, glommed onto the support and forgot about the ifs. And if I instead had written it that I wouldn't support it unless, that people would have spent more time looking at the unlesses. Um, because the unlesses I had in there, um, because, because the ifs, which are the unlesses uh, in the wouldn't support scenario, had to do with taxing the pipeline in order to support renewable energy. Um, because I completely agree with the economic analysis that's been done that says that any um, anything that reduces the price of oil is a bad thing. And so what I wanted to do was simply make the transportation of oil safer. And, but I wanted to make it safer, but more expensive. And so the idea, my, my plan for Keystone was to make the transportation safer, make it less CO2 intensive, in its uh, emissions um, require Canada to use less CO2 in its extraction as a condition on it, but then tax the pipeline for renewable energy. But as I say, people only looked at the um, you know, part that would support it if you had all of these and they forgot about the, the all the conditions that were on there. Ah, uh, yes. Mm. 
<laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. So the question is, um, what do you do if um, uh, political leaders won't listen to science? Um, okay. So uh, that um, that that can be very difficult. As I said in the very beginning, political leaders will weigh lots of inputs politics, economics, social equity, and um, on some things they do have to involve science. And one thing that was done early in the Obama administration was to require that all of the federal agencies have a scientific integrity policy. And the scientific integrity policy applies to all of the scientists and all the political appointees. So it prevents the political appointees in an agency from changing the science that comes out of those agencies. So for, um, for those decisions that require scientific input, I think we're fairly safe. But that doesn't mean that Congress um, couldn't decide to do something and uh, downweigh downweight the science or completely ignore the science. Um, that, is, that is a threat. And the only thing that stands in the way is all of you, the voters. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. So the question is, um, do we we not have uh, effective policies because um, uh, science appears to be biased? Um, I don't believe that at all. And let me give you an example. Um, bar none, the most effective policy that we have on the books that has influenced the release of, of um, pollutants into the atmosphere that are causing climate change is the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol, above and beyond anything, has limited more greenhouse gas emissions than anything else. And it wasn't, it wasn't designed to do that. It was designed to um, deal with the ozone hole. Okay, now let's look at what the history of the uh, Montreal Protocol was. First, there was the science that showed that it was the chlorofluorocarbons 
from uh, aerosol cans and refrigerants and things like that that was creating this um, reaction in the atmosphere that was breaking down the ozone. What happened? Industry did everything it could to discredit that science and say, oh, that science is all wrong. Oh, no, there's too much doubt. Oh, no, that can't be right. Oh, no, well, it would be too expensive. Oh, well, well who really needs ozone anyway? You know, all, all, all the things. But secretly, DuPont started working on a replacement for the chlorofluorocarbons. And the same industry that was saying, oh, it's not a problem, or oh, it's not us, or oh, who needs ozone? Finally, when they had a replacement for it, they stood up and said, oh, you're right. It's a big problem. And oh, we've got to get rid of it. And oh, by the way, we have the replacement, and so everyone will buy our replacement. And the Montreal Protocol was signed like that. And the ozone is now recovering. So taking that analogy with climate change, the problem is our addiction to fossil fuels. If we had an easy solution to climate change that didn't negatively impact our quality of life, I think all of those groups that are seeding the, the, that are sowing the seeds of doubt would turn around and say, oh, we'll turn around tomorrow and we'll just use cellulose biofuels. No problem. We got the answer, and we're going to make a lot of money doing it. So, no. Yeah. Uh, Mark, and then here. Um, so help, um, help average people or just even help the scientists? <laughs> help help policy makers understand the uncertainties. Um, you know, I think that um, to help the, the policy makers, the question is how can we help policy makers understand the uncertainties? Um, I think the better thing to do is to not focus on helping policymakers understand the uncertainties in the science. I think it is much better to help them understand the uncertainties in um, the decision space. So for example, take the port of Long Beach. Um, Long Beach is a coastal dependent facility. It's got to be on the ocean. Um, if, um, let's suppose the mayor of Long Beach has a decision to make. Um, uh, do I invest in um, uh, a billion dollars in upgrading the port right now or Am I going to have to move this port inland shortly? And so is it better to only put $100 million into it now and bank the rest of the money, knowing that I'm going to have to um, do some adjustments for sea level rise? Or am I better to um, do something radically different, like consider a floating port which is um, completely um, sea level independent that will uh, forever keep up, keep rise with sea level and invest in that right now 
and I don't have to worry um, because that uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm never again going to be at the whim of sea level rise. So those are decisions that science could help um, uh, that mayor make um, because they could say, here's what we can tell you about the uncertainty on um, an inland retreat versus uh, a floating uh, port versus, um, you know, staying put. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the question was about um, classified science. Um, there is um, a group called the CAC, which is the Civil Applications Committee, um, which uh, USGS chairs, um, that uh, consists of the heads of all of the, um, well, not the heads, but they're, heads are their designees, of all of the um, classified um, intelligence agencies. And um, the, um, uh, the CAC gets together regularly to scan all of their information for um, whatever data would be helpful for example, for either climate change science or for uh, emergencies or uh, whatever, um, in order to um, get that information declassified. So um, a couple examples. Sea ice information um, was previously classified because there were submarine, um, there was submarine data that showed um, ice thickness from underneath. Um, as well as, you know, data from above on um, sea ice extent. Um, it turns out that the thickness of sea ice was just as important as understanding its extent. And so the CAC arranged for that data to be um, unclassified. Um, the CAC also arranged, for example, when uh, the Haiti earthquake happened, for a lot of high-resolution geospatial information to be declassified. So the CAC um, meets uh, in order to make sure that um, uh, very important, relevant, classified data um, that is important to um, climate gets, yeah. Um, that um, could be uh, what often happens is it gets zeroed out and then sometimes it gets put back in. So we'll see what happens. Okay, uh, let's have um, one last question over there and then we can talk afterwards. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, right. Okay. So, so you're you you've hit right. Uh, the question is, um, uh, how many of the 200 babies live to adulthood? I don't think we know. And is anyone um, introducing any natural predators for them? Not that I know of. Um, so, yeah. So this is this is uh, this is a huge problem. And um, yeah.